Okay, so we're good. Come on. All right. Hey. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Okay, so it's a pretty easy question. What's the first thing that you do when you wake up in the morning? What do you do when you wake up in the morning? Brush your teeth. Okay, what about you? Read. What do you do when you wake up in the morning? Eat breakfast. What do you do when you wake up in the morning? You don't know? What about you? Stretch. I like that. I like that. I have to tell you that the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I look at my phone. Oh, and I shouldn't because then I can't stop looking at my phone. What about when you go to bed at night? What's the last thing that you do before you go to sleep? What do you do? What do you do? Brush your teeth. Very good. You still brush your teeth? Read? (laughs) So you read before you go to bed and right when you wake up? That's awesome. What about you guys? What do you do right before you go to bed? Stretch? You play with your phone a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I think we all kind of have our own little routines that we do in the morning and the evening. Did you know that there's this guy named Martin Luther, which is what our church is named after, he lived 500 years ago. And, of course, they didn't have phones or really fun toothbrushes back then. But um, the one thing that he would do every night before he went to bed and every morning, the first thing he would do when he woke up was this. He would make the sign of the cross on his forehead. He would remind himself that he's a child of God and that God loves him through Jesus. So let's practice that. Can you make the sign of the cross on your forehead? Y'all, before bedtime, yes, we also eat dinner before bedtime. And then after that, Martin Luther would do this. He would make a little cross on his forehead. Can you do that? Can you make a cross on your forehead like that? Can you guys do that? Can, can you make a cross on your forehead? Let's see if we can ask the big kids out there. Can you all make a cross on your forehead? There you go. And can you remind yourself, say, I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. Now look at somebody around you and say, you're a child of God. And if we remember that... I think our day is probably going to go okay. Let's pray. Thank you, gracious God, for being with us when we go to sleep, when we wake up, and reminding us that you have us all and that we are your children. Amen. So we have been moving through the gospel of Mark over the past few weeks, and, uh, and it's clear that Jesus is also moving along. In fact, our gospel even says on the way, he's moving from one place to the next. And where we find Jesus today is in the city of Caesarea Philippi, this area. And this is probably the furthest away from Jerusalem in our gospel that Jesus gets. And it's here that we're at this pinnacle part of the gospel of Mark, where Jesus is now going to start focusing his attention on moving toward the cross and moving toward the resurrection. But to know where we're going, we also have to be aware of where we've been. So for the past couple of weeks, as we've been moving through Mark, we met Jesus talking with the Pharisees and the scribes, challenging them to open their hearts to understand the purpose of the law is so that way people can be in the presence of God, not gain entry into the church or the temple. And then he meets this woman while he's traveling to another town and he's having lunch And this woman comes into the house, and she's a Gentile, and she challenges Jesus, saying, I would like to be in the presence of the divine. I want to be in the presence of God as well. And Jesus recognizes that he's the stumbling block to her, and all of a sudden, he opens up the ministry to Gentiles and Jews. And then Jesus moves on out of there and goes and finds a man that is deaf, that that has a speech impediment, and he heals him. And then he goes to the next town, and he feeds thousands of people. He goes to the next town, and he heals somebody that is blind. And that's where we get to today's gospel. They've been moving this whole time. And he looks at the disciples and says, we've gone everywhere. You've seen all these things that have been happening. I, I wonder, what are people talking about? What are they saying about me? What, who do they think that I am? And they're quick. Oh, you're like Elijah. I mean, you're like this really powerful prophet. I mean, you're preaching the word of God and everybody's listening to you. And we're, we're really doing some really cool stuff. And you're probably going to get your own chariot. It's going to be flaming. You're going to go into heaven. It's going to be awesome. Oh, no, you're like John the Baptist. You're willing to stick it to the man. You're willing to tell it like it is. And you got all these followers with you. This is really great. We're on your team. Oh, you're kind of like one of the prophets because we're, we're kind of in our own exile right now. We're in our own exodus. You know, poor us. We're glad that you're with us. We're all behind you, Jesus. And he looks at them and he says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And it's this point that Peter gets like this fit of spiritual inspiration. And he's like, you're the Messiah which is really beautiful because it's the first time in the Gospel of Mark that we hear the word Messiah. 
Peter's pointing out, you're the one we've been waiting for. You're the one that Scripture has been announcing. You're the one that all the stories have been pointing us toward. We're with you. This is exciting. And then Jesus sternly orders them not to say anything to anyone. And right after this, he tells them what this means. Now, we're going to pause there for a second before we go into that. You would think that these people that have been following Jesus and have such exuberance about what he's doing and are so excited to be on this team would probably listen to everything he says and just follow suit. But they don't. And sometimes neither do we. So three times Jesus is going to have to explain to the disciples. Three times he's going to explain what a Messiah means. And each time it's about his suffering and his death and resurrection. And then each time the disciples are going to argue, no, no, no. And each time he's going to explain what it means to follow him, what it means to be a disciple. So the first time is with Peter. The second time is about who's going to be the greatest. And then it's James and John arguing over seats in the car, okay? So right now, Jesus is looking at his disciples, and he says, who do you say that I am? Peter, of course, shouts out, Messiah! And he wins the prize for the day until Jesus says, here's what this means. You remember those people that we were asking them to open up their hearts so that way people could see God in their midst, they could go and be in the presence of God, the scribes and the Pharisees and all those people? They're going to arrest me, says Jesus. They're going to have me beaten. And you remember that woman and and the Jewish people that we were having lunch with? They're going to kill me, and then three days later, I'm going to rise. And somehow, some way, they get stuck on the, the getting hurt and the dying part, and they miss resurrection. They miss it. They absolutely miss it, and they're so stuck. And that's when Peter grabs Jesus, and he pulls him aside. Come on, but we need to talk. We need to talk. No! No, you can't do this. No, please, no, don't do this. Do you realize what you're doing? This is political suicide. Don't do it. We're on a roll, Jesus. Come on now. Don't do this now. Don't say that. Shh. And then Jesus rebukes Peter and says one of the best lines in Scripture, and I always have to make sure, you probably do this as well, whenever I'm saying this from the pulpit that I don't look at anybody. Uh, (laughs) He says, get behind me, Satan. Now, that's a great line. You can look up and research why he's using the word Satan in there. But I want to talk about the concept of rebuking. Because in the Greek, it means sternly order. And don't you remember whenever Peter says the Messiah, he sternly orders them to say nothing. And then Peter rebukes Jesus, sternly ordering him to turn around. And then he, in turn, looks at Peter and sternly orders him, saying, No! You're so stuck on yourself and human things. I'm talking about something greater than that, something divine, something holy, something sacred. And then he looks at the crowd And he says, if any of you want to follow me and be my disciple, you're going to have to deny yourself, take up your cross, and do what I've been doing and follow me. Now, to deny yourself, also in the Greek, means to disown yourself. So, if we're going to disown ourselves, who's going to own us? Anybody? God. And that's hard to do. If we're going to disown ourselves, that means we're going to have to look at God and say, okay, you can have absolutely everything that I am, all the good stuff, all the bad stuff, it's yours, take it, it's all yours, show me what you want me to be, tell me where you want me to go, what is it that you want me to do? And Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow. Okay, well, what was Jesus doing? He was talking to people that are in political uh, uh, appointments and authority, and he's challenging them. To see God and asking them to look for God and what they're doing. He's meeting somebody that doesn't look like him, doesn't act like him, isn't from the same town, speaks a different language. And he welcomes her to the table and feeds her. He goes and he finds people that are sick, that are suffering, that are blind, that are deaf. And he heals them, that are hungry, and he feeds them. He serves others. If we're going to turn our life over to this beautiful God that we proclaim then we follow what Jesus was doing and we help others and we invite people to to find God dwelling wherever it is that we are. Now, as people of this congregation, we already have a leg up because we are called, what church? Abiding Presence. We got called that on purpose. Thank you, Bill Brueggemann. 
abiding presence because we are the abiding presence of God in the world. That's what we have been called to do. And we have this identity of a congregation as a place of grace, and it's God's grace, not our grace. It's God's grace. It's this undeserved gift that is poured out on all of us, and it's abundant, and we all get the same amount, and we're just dripping with grace upon grace upon grace. We can't stop it. And then we say that all are welcome. And that's the hard part. That's the really hard part. Because all are welcome means that those political leaders and those people that sit in seats of power that are abusing it are welcome to find God dwelling here, to see that we are the abiding presence of God in the world. Which means that those people that believe different, that, that maybe have a close communion, or maybe they, they don't even believe in Jesus, Maybe they're, they're from a different country, have never even heard it, speak a different language, are a different color, are welcome here to find God dwelling here, to meet the abiding presence of God here. Which also means that those that are hungry, those that are hurting, those that, that have diseases, those that are, that are wrestling with whatever it might be in their life are welcome here to find God dwelling here, to see the abiding presence of God here. And it also means that if you're wearing a Swifty bracelet or a MAGA hat, you are welcome here to find God dwelling here, to be the abiding presence of God here. It's hard to do that, especially when somebody is diametrically opposed. If I'm turning everything over and I'm disowning myself, that means I'm letting go of those things and asking God to guide me and to do what Jesus did, which is where our mission statement comes in. We're called to seek God in everything that we do and serve others. And we do that everywhere, every day, and with everyone. Amen.